This story has been recorded at an Addictive Eaters Anonymous meeting in New Zealand. You can email us at contact at aeanz.org. And as it's the first Friday of the month, we have a guest speaker, and tonight that speaker is Robin. My name's Robin, and I'm an addictive eater. Hi, Robin. I tried the lipstick, but I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's good to be here. I'm sitting there, my heart is actually racing, and I don't know why. But it reminded me of what my heart was like once before I came in here one night after I had eaten so much that um, my heart was beating so hard that I thought I was going to die. And I slept sitting up because it was just pumping away there from just being overweight and overworked from just eating the food that day. So, um, yeah, but it's not like that today. It's... um, I guess it might have been because Lynette was getting close to home and saying who it could be mm-hmm. and isn't there thinking yeah. But anyway, I came in here because of the weight, because of um, the um, madness that was in my head, that's what I called it, and um, I, couldn't, I couldn't diet anymore. I tried all the diets and I just couldn't do it and I didn't know what was wrong with me. And I was talking tonight with um, Sarah and just, you know, sharing one or two things of just what it was like. And it just seems like it's a, just a, another, another life for sure, a totally different life than what life is like today, to be able to um, just do what I do on my day and just have my meals and get on. And because I couldn't do that, it was, you know, certainly always um, planning on what you know, what the next meal was going to be. And I remember, you know, having Christmas and asking everybody, well, where are we going next Christmas? And they all looked at me as if to say, for goodness sake, let's get through today, you know. And and um, and I understand what that means today, but I, it was like, you know, I had to know. I had to know when the next feast was coming from. And, um, yeah, so for me, you know, everything started at a very early age, but, you know, the last thing that I tried to stop was my eating um, because I thought everything else was the problem, you know, the smoking, the coffee, the tea, you know, the drinking. Um, The drinking didn't stop completely, the smoking did, the coffee and the tea and the Milo did um, because I thought that that was, you know, a big problem. But um, the others just didn't and I used to, you know, go to bed at night after I'd stopped smoking and I used to say, well, I haven't had a cigarette today and I don't want to have one tomorrow. And and I really meant it because, you know, I'd smoked since I was about 10 and, um, and I was forced to give up the cigarettes through my ex-husband not buying them and threatening to go down and get more and he was already drunk. And I thought, well, you know, you don't. I knew that he would never get home with them anyway, so I had my last cigarette and I verbally killed everybody for about two weeks. You know, what came out of my mouth was not nice, I remember that. And I was always busy. You know, the table got cleared as soon as I was finished eating, um, whether they were or not, because I had to just keep my hands busy. So, you know, that that stopped. And, um, and then I thought, well, the coffee and the tea, because I drank a lot of that, and I drank coffee when I smoked. And um, so I thought, well, they were the problems. And I ended up getting a real good headache from stopping my coffee because I drank about 15 cups a day. And my days went into about two or three in the morning. So, you know, they would start about six and they lasted a long time. So that was a lot of time to drink coffee. It wasn't like the coffee that they have today. You know, it was just good old Greeks. So, you know, that was the problem. I thought that was the problem, but it wasn't. And um, so then, you know, I just went down the diet track and and I just, I could stay on a diet for about a month and that would be it, about it. And um, and then something would happen, something would happen and I'd say, I'll show you, I'll show you. And then I would start, you know, eating. And I didn't know it as eating. I didn't know that it was, um, you know, an obsession I had. Um, I didn't know any of those things until I came in here. But I certainly did start eating. And then there would be the battle of getting up in the morning that I wouldn't want to get up. I wanted to get up. I wanted to get up and get going because that's what I did. 
I was driven, but I didn't want to because I knew what was going to happen. I knew that as soon as I had that one slither of cake off the kids' lunch or that one piece of toast extra than what I allowed myself to have, that I'd be gone. I knew that, but I just, and I didn't know how to stop it. So, you know, there was that constant battle day in and day out. And, um, and it was the same with the alcohol, you know. I know that um, as soon as I had that first drink, I wanted more. And, and I loved the effect that I got from it. But, you know, as time went on, that effect, it took more to get that effect. And I didn't understand any of that. I didn't know that that's what it was. But, you know, I was always um, trying to just find that, that hit. And we were talking yesterday at work, there was something come up and I was talking with um, someone and I said, you know, when I used to get a, start to get a cold, um, I would know that I was getting a cold or a flu and I would be always looking for something tasty to eat, you know, be pickles or something because I was a sweet eater. I loved cake, I loved cake, ice cream, lollies, all those things. And um, because I'm a Torian and they said you should always eat your sweets, I read that once in my stars that you should always eat your sweets first. But they didn't tell you that you didn't eat them afterwards, you just <laughs> ate them first. Well, I ate them first, second and third. And, um, but you know, so I, I liked sweets, but you know, when I was getting a cold or something, I was always looking for something savoury. And I'd, I'd, I'd cook up onions and do all that because I just wanted to taste something. It never worked. But, you know, I had fun doing it. And um, so, you know, I never understood that, you know, it was all to do with just, you know, being an addictive eater. And that once I started, I couldn't stop until I went to bed. And I used to hear people share, you know, that like Kay used to share that if you didn't eat after 12 o'clock, you were okay. And I thought, oh, I never used to go to bed before 12 o'clock. <laughs> and, um, you know, but I never thought like that. And I thought, oh, well, you know, that, that's that's how it was. But, you know, my days would start so early. And um, and to me, breakfast was the main meal. But, you know, it certainly dragged on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember going to my sister's. We used to go up to my sister's at Five Rivers. And, um, and we would do breakfast in stages because the kids would get up later and I don't know, my breakfast could go on for three or four hours, you know, and I don't think anybody ever really noticed how much I ate. I knew because I used to feel bad about how much I would eat, but, you know, I would just sit down and have breakfast with this one and then I'd sit down and have breakfast with the next one and, and I knew and I loved it, but I don't know whether ever anyone ever noticed, but... You know, there was just so much that would be going on in my head at the time, and I never, ever shared it, never talked about it. Went to the doctor several times, and the doctor just told me the only thing I can give you, well, that I can't give you, Robin, and that you need is willpower. And I thought, well, I, you know, I just knew that I didn't have it when it came to food. As long as I didn't have that whatever, I was okay, but, you know, it was just that constant battle. I ate things that I didn't like. In the end, you know, swore I'd never eat more bars because they made me sick, and then I could see myself eating three of them, one after the other. It made me sick. But, you know, I ate them. And, um, yeah. So there was all that, you know, constant and gaining weight, losing weight, thinking that when I was thin, I'd be better, you know, and being where I was in my family, and, you know, I was always, I was always the happy one. Well, I was always laughing and joking and, and being all that, but I wasn't, not inside. And um, I was the bossy one. And I was the one that said things straight out. I was the one that, um, you know, I didn't beat around the bush. And, um, and I didn't like being like that neither. It was the same with my family, you know. If I said to my kids, jump, you jumped high. And, um, and I was saying to Sarah, you know, like part of my cleaning, the drivenness with the cleaning. And I said, I used to watch my kids come home from school and I'd say, you're not leaving that there, eh? You know, and that's what I'd say if they dropped their bag down there, which was a normal place probably to drop their bag, but I'd say, you're not leaving that there, eh? And so they would have to go and do something with it. And, um, and I said, you know, I never, I never smacked my children or physically abuse them, but mentally I did. I realised that coming into a meeting, sitting in a meeting one day, and I thought, how the hell did I bring up those kids? You know, because it was just tension. I can see, you know, it was just tension in the house, and I was the cause of it. 
And um, I used to, you know, criticise my ex-husband because he drank and I used to think that, you know, when he'd come home at night and he'd been drinking and I used to think we never knew whether to laugh or cry, but I realised that I was the same, you know, because I could walk in the room and clear it just by, and I wouldn't say anything. Mm. It would be just the look on the face, you know, and I used to think, why do they do that? Why, why do they stay with Alan and chat with Alan, the kids' friends, but they didn't with me? Because, you know, and I thought it was just a look on my face. And uh, when I was in a bad mood, I cleaned my drawers and they heard them. You know, they'd know that I was in a bad mood. I wouldn't say it, but I'd be up there and I'd be pulling my drawers out and I'd be fixing the drawers up and I'd be slamming the drawers shut and they would know, you know. And it was just, just... All behaviours that I see today that I just had no idea what it was all about. And, um, and you know, and sometimes I just think, my God, an awful person. But I came in here and I um, eventually made it here, um, moved to Christchurch and didn't want to move to Christchurch, city that I hated. And, um, but moved here and within a few months of moving here, I read the ad in the paper, you know, and um, about weight. And of course, you know, I was obviously still looking because I'd been on the herbal life diet and I remember ringing my sister-in-law and telling her that I couldn't do it. I couldn't diet anymore. I had to have that drink at lunchtime and I rang her at 11 o'clock and I said, I can't do it. I can't wait for tea. It was salad for tea. And I said, I can't, I can't do it anymore. So that was my last, you know, diet. And, um, and I just know that life was terribly miserable and um, unmanageable, as it says in step one. But um, I just, just didn't know. And I sat there on that Saturday morning and I was reading the paper and it was like a neon sign and it said, is food causing you a problem or whatever? And there was an address to write to. And I went to work because I had a job. Um, I'd just not long started a job and I went to work and I worked with a group of older women, older than me, and I said to them, did they know anything about this 12-step fellowship? And they said, I think you'll find it's religious. That was enough. That one word was enough. So I wiped it. I thought, well, nobody's going to preach bloody God to me. You know, because if that's what it was, it was not. But anyway, um, went home and, you know, just carried on life. But life became worse. And I remember going, I, we lived where we are, basically where we are now. And I worked over in Sydney. And I remember finding KB's Bakery. And there was one on the corner just before I went to work. And I remember um, finding enough money to buy six pieces of their fudge. And, and I did it to take home for the family for afternoon tea, you know, because I finished work at three o'clock. And I left them on the seat beside me. And by the time I got home, there was an empty bag there. I had eaten them all the way home, which is probably about 15, 20 minute trip. And that was the last time that I, you know, can clearly remember doing something that I was not happy with. You know, I thought if I put them in the boot, they probably would have gone home, but I didn't. And so, um, and it was the fact that, you know, it was scrounging for the money as well, which I used to do when, you know, to buy my cigarettes when they were about $2 a packet. Not like they are today. And, um, but I remember that and thinking this is terrible, but didn't know what to do about it. And so life went on a bit more, a few more weeks, and there was a few more kilos probably went on and a lot of madness that went with it. And um, I shared um, my story on Monday night and I said I remember the last what I call insane act and that was about telling my family at tea time that I was getting the dog that we owned at the time put down. Because my theory was, um, you know, if you caused a problem, I got rid of you. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, and, and that was it. You know, out of sight, out of mind. And this dog was causing a problem. He was a big dog, and he moved to Christchurch with us, and we were in a small house, and he loved the fire, and we had an open fire. And he used to, he used to basically just about put his nose in the fire, and these two boys, which were teenage boys, used to like to sit by the fire and they used to complain about the dog and I turned him into a compulsive eater you know I did because when I ate he ate because I couldn't stand the thought of this drooling dog I couldn't put him outside which would be sanity sane to do but no so I didn't so anyway 
this particular day and it was raining and it was miserable and so I rang up the vet and I asked how much it was to get the dog put down it was $45. So anyway I thought well that's one way we'll solve this problem by getting rid of the dog. So we were sitting at the tea table and everybody was you know, going mad about the dog and I just sat there and said well I've made a decision we're going to get the dog put down. Well it was like more you know everybody stopped eating they were all too scared and I just started crying because I knew that that was insane. I knew that it was mad, but I didn't know what else to do. So, you know, everybody loved the dog after that until the dog died, you know, naturally. And um, so, yeah, so that was probably the last thing that I remember that I was just so crazy about. And so I read the ad again in the paper, another day, another Saturday in the paper, and that time I did something about it and um, so I wrote a letter away because there was no phones on back then and I wrote a letter and I talked to this person she rang me up and she told me she was going on holiday for two weeks and she shared a bit of a story and she gave me a phone number and um, and I said to her no I'll be fine I'll be fine you go and have your holiday I'll be fine but somewhere along the line of I'll be fine and two weeks of her coming back, I wasn't. And um, I tried frantically to get a hold of this person and um, eventually I did. And uh, that person came round and I spent the weekend cleaning because she was coming on Sunday morning and I had to have everything clean. And um, she came round and shared her story. and. My first thought was, you know, when she was leaving, it was after she left, and she turned around and she said, um, you know, she said, well, you really helped me because I haven't had to eat today. And she was thin and I wasn't. And I just thought, shite. <laughs> oh, my God, they don't eat. And I thought, you know, they don't eat. And, and But, you know, it didn't put me off because she said she didn't have to eat. And I didn't understand what that meant, but I just thought, oh, Okay, and um, but it just, it didn't put me off finding out because she said she would come and pick me up and take me to a meeting. And I can't remember, she shared a story and I think there was a little bit about, um, it was a spiritual program, I think there may have been something like that. But I really now can't remember, but anyway, she said she would come and pick me up and take me to a meeting. So that's what happened on the Wednesday night. So I went to the Wednesday night meeting and I walked in there and, and um, there was, you know, quite a few people. And it was wooden seats and I had on a pink sweatshirt and a black skirt because I always think of Kay and talking about, you know, what you wear. And I think, yeah, that was just about my limit of what I could, you know, get into. And I sat there and Kay was in the chair and she had the big book on her knee and I didn't see the steps, so they were there. They were there, but I didn't see them. And um, and people just started to share about, um, you know, what they had done with the food. And a lot of it is what I was still doing, but had never told a soul. You know, the madness of it, like shoving biscuits up my sleeve and going up to my bedroom to eat it so the dog wouldn't see the dog wouldn't see it, you know. And then there would be somebody say that they ate in the toilet and thought, oh, I never did that. But, you know, it didn't mean to say that I didn't just continually eat. It was my ways and it was their ways. So, yeah. So from that first meeting, I just felt hope. I, I, I just felt that, you know, there was just hope that here were people sharing what I was doing, but I had never told anybody. And um, so, you know, I went to another meeting. And, um, and that's what I did. I got picked up and taken to the meetings and um, then after about a couple of weeks, it might have been more, my ride said to me one day um, that she couldn't take me to the meeting. And it was a Tuesday night and so it was way over in Linwood. It was over at the tyre company away over there and I thought, oh holy gosh, um, <laughs> I'm going to have to drive because, you know, we lived over High High and I was the country girl and I hated driving because, you know, the two lanes and I'd had a, an accident in a, um, a truck had backed into me once, a big coal truck had backed into me when we lived down south and he kept pushing the car back. I had the guy from the coal mine next to me, thank goodness. 
and, and it just terrorised me seeing trucks. So when you're on the motorway and you've got a truck in front of you and one there, I was a sandwich as far as I was concerned. I was the meat in the sandwich. And so it frightened me. And so I knew the route to go to work and I knew the route to come home, but I didn't do too well otherwise. But anyway, this Tuesday night, I just got in my car and I drove. And I was so pleased when I got home from that meeting because I got the lights all the way down, Morehouse, and then into Blenheim Road, and I was just so excited. And I thought, you know, that I could do it. But I know today that the want to go to that meeting was greater than the fear that I had for the driving. And, um, and so, you know, that's what I did. And so, you know, I went to the meeting and I guess today I think about it and I think, oh, well, it was probably to see whether, you know, you're going to go to a meeting on your own or whether you're going to just wait and let me pick you up. But I know that I just felt something different when I sat in a meeting. I didn't know what it was, but there was something here. And, you know, all I heard was, you know, don't pick up the first one, which I didn't understand, you know, get to your meeting, which I could handle and help someone else and get a sponsor. And I didn't know what the sponsor business was, but I wouldn't ask because by asking meant I didn't know. And I portrayed to everybody that I knew everything, but I just knew diddly squat. And um, so anyway, I kept coming to the meetings and then eventually someone said, you know, a sponsor is person that you could, you know, relate to or wanted what they had and that's what I wanted. You know, I wanted what I saw in the older members. I wanted I wanted what I saw in those brethren ladies that used to come into my favourite dairy in Edendale. You know, there was something about them and it was peace. It was serenity, you know, they they had something that I wanted and I asked my friend that owned the dairy, what is it about those women? And he said that word religion. He said, I think you'll find it's their religion. Well, that <laughs> gone. And um, so, you know, I was going to have no one tell me about that. But I saw it here with the people that were before me. And I thought, you know, I knew that there was something. And I heard that, you know, it wasn't about the food, the food plan. And I knew that somehow because I knew that it was my head was the problem, that it was just that total madness in my life, you know, the way the way I lived life. And, um, and I didn't want to be that type of mother that I was or that bossy person that, you know, um, they couldn't decide, you know, my husband couldn't decide which way to take me to work because whichever way he took me, I would always complain about it, you know. I didn't want to be like that and um, you know my youngest sister got the tail end of my um, well the good end or the bad end of you know my mind one time and and um, and you know I've made amends with her but I think there's still that there because you know I just spoke my mind and um, because no one else would and I thought that I had to do it you know and so I didn't I didn't want to be like that but I didn't know how not to be like that but I've certainly learned through coming in here, so it's certainly a lot more than just about the weight, I found, you know, that um, the weight, as they say, takes care of itself, and, um, and that is so true, but, you know, I learned um, what that first one, don't pick up that first one, I learned what that meant, and that meant if I didn't have that first one, I wouldn't have all the others, you know, that one biscuit wouldn't turn into a packet. And yesterday, was it yesterday? Oh, yes, we had an impromptu birthday party at work yesterday. So a woman came in and put a cake down, and she was 50, and we didn't know this. And so, you know, that was fine. So she had the birthday cake on there, and I said, oh, do we do balloons? Do we do, you know, no, 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 she's just wanting to have her birthday cake. And then they said, oh, no, we'll do balloons. And the boss went out and bought some flares, and... I was busy, you know, getting ready. I was cooking a roast dinner and that. And I said, oh, I know when we get some balloons. So we go away to Janelle's cupboard and we get the balloons and we get the banners. And I said, oh, we'll have a tablecloth. So we have a tablecloth. And then we have sprinkles and then we have the serviettes and then we get the good plates. And mm -hmm. I created a party in 10 minutes. And I heard one of the girls say, I love it when Robin knows where everything is. Mm -hmm. And um, and I thought, yeah, well, that, that was good. And so they were sitting there and they were talking and she'd bought this cheesecake and... Um, Thing. and so everybody was having it and they were all talking about it and then they were talking about ice cream they said nobody could sit and eat a two liter of ice cream and i'm sitting there and they said no nobody would you know you'd, you'd you wouldn't be able to do that and i said yes you can <laughs> <laughs> and really, would you do that and i said yeah not a problem 
chocolate sauce with it and fruit salad and bananas, you know. And they just sort of, you know, thought, oh, well, you know, she's probably not telling the truth, but it was. Because, you know, that's what it did, you know. You just used to eat it or else just keep going backwards and forward to the freezer and do it. So I just thought, you know, it's so good today not to be like that, you know. And to have these wee things but be happy to contribute but not want it, you know. And I just sat there and I talked and I had my cup of tea and, and you know, and just was all part of it. But there was nothing, you know, and they, you know, nobody said anything, nobody offered me any because they know that I don't have it and I just think that's a great freedom because I've been upfront and honest and said, well, you know, I just don't do that and, and then they probably didn't believe the honesty about how I used to eat two litres of ice cream because what's the point in having one in a cone, you know, so, and, and that was how it was. But, you know, today I just think that's, that's what that first one meant. Don't pick up that first one, you know, and helping someone else, well... I never understood what that meant, but I do know, you know, it takes me away from me because there's a lot of me there and, um, you know, coming in here and finding out that, you know, self-centred and you had resentments and, um, you know, you weren't a very nice person and um, and I thought, you know, that um, the world revolved around me and I was talking to Sarah tonight and saying, you know, that I was going to live forever because I couldn't stand the thought of not being here and seeing my children have children have children and that the world would not be able to cope without me, but, you know, it's just all self-centeredness. And so, you know, I'm hoping that, you know, that that has got, you know, a bit better, and um, the fear of dying has gone. I, I don't have that fear like I used to. I used to be really, you know, mortified that I was going to die because I wouldn't be here, but, you know, today um, I think, you know, it's fine. It's fine. I found a life that I never ever dreamed I would ever have and um, as long as I do cyber I'll be fine you know and that's that's what I plan to do um, one day at a time and the religious thing you know well that that was a huge thing in my life and I could never ever tell anybody how I actually felt when I went into a church which was not very often you know just a funeral or a wedding and um, but my sister and I used to sneak into them and I did when I was younger and there was just something about that feeling that when I was in a church but I could never tell anyone that because I was the loud mouth cussing person and I thought you know they'd see me as weak if I did that but um, you know I learned when I came in here the difference between religion and spirituality and that you know it says to find a God of my own understanding and I I heard that one day in a meeting and um, and I thought that's right, that's all I have to do and that's what I have done, you know, and I've had that feeling that, you know, everything's going to be all right, that, you know, it will be fine and, um, and I've gone from, you know, eating one day to not eating and from, you know, drinking to not drinking, just like I did when I didn't have that last smoke, I went from smoking to not smoking and, you know, and I have learned to pray and I've had learned to to do things that I never ever thought that I would ever do and the steps, you know, they they didn't make me want to do cartwheels, you know, step four and five because I certainly wasn't going to tell anybody my secrets but I had because I heard it sitting in a meeting and it was like I was being told that if I don't do this I won't get well and I wanted what I seen, I wanted what I would seen here and, and that peace of mind and um, and that's, so that's what I had to do, and you know, and the eight and nine, you know, making those amends because I stole a lot of things from where I worked, and I returned those stolen items, and I made you know a, a money um, amends, and I sent money, and I got this letter. I don't even know what happened to it. It disappeared, um, and because I you know was going to keep it, but I got a letter from who I worked for at that time, and they wished me well on my new life because I just briefly explained, you know, what I was doing. And, and, you know, it was a government department, so I was lucky I wasn't taken away, you know, and, um, you know, taken to court for it because it was stealing. You know, but I could justify it because that's what I did with everything. I could justify and deny anything. And um, so, you know, that's what I did. But, you know, they wish me well. And, and so, you know, today I can go past that place and not feel guilt of what I have done, you know, so, um, yeah.
So anyway, that's about it. My life today is just absolutely so different and um, I never ever thought that I would ever have the life that I have today. Um, I do feel like I've had three lives. I've had the life down south, I've had the life when I come in here, I've also had the, the life without a husband and you know, and that's my, my third life and um, and you know, just I never ever thought that, you know, we, we had no money when we moved here but you know, became a bit of a workaholic and earned enough money to buy a house and then um, bought my husband out and um, and I never thought that I would ever be able to pay you know, a mortgage. And I have a job that I've been in for quite a long time and um, and I never thought that I'd be able to, to do that job. You know, I love my job. It's Friday, I like it even better at this time of the day and, um, and tomorrow's Saturday, that's even good. But you know, I never thought that I would ever be able to, um, that I'd ever be where I am today as far as that goes. And, and I can see the jobs that I have done in my mind in the past and they were just jobs. You know, and, um, and I never ever thought that it would all be because I was overweight and that I came in here just looking for a solution to be thin and um, to get out of the madness that was in my head. And, um, you know, so, yeah, so I've lost weight, but there's a lot more because that madness is not there like it was. And, uh, you know, it's a great freedom today to be able to do what I've done in my day. And, um, you know, we've had happy air. And um, so I've been around, you know, alcohol and, you know, there's food. But it just, it's just not there. And I do believe that God's either removed the problem or he hasn't. And I believe today that he has because it's just such a freedom. And um, it's great to be here. So I'll keep coming because it's good to be alive today. So thank you. Thanks, Robert.